the Reconstruction period, the period of 1863 to 1877. So the war actually ends in 1865, but Reconstruction plans begin prior to the war ending. So at the end of the war, there were some pretty big issues that were still unanswered that needed to be uh, taken care of by the government. First of all, how do you rebuild the South's shattered economy? especially after the total war and the end of slavery. What would be the place in society for the four million freed blacks? What responsibility does the federal government have to those freed blacks? And what should happen to the states that seceded the Union? Should they be punished or allowed to rejoin the Union? And finally, who gets to decide? Was this Congress's decision or was this President Lincoln's decision? So initially, there are several reconstruction plans that are proposed. And Lincoln and his vice president, Johnson, proposed um, their plan for reconstruction. And they wanted the South to meet a minimum test of loyalty to rejoin the Union. They also wanted a proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction, which actually was proclaimed in 1863 which would give full presidential pardons to Southerners who swore an oath of allegiance to the Union and the Constitution and accepted the emancipation of slaves, ending slavery in the South. State governments could be reestablished and accepted as legitimate as soon as 10% of the voters in that state took that oath. So here you have people swearing their allegiance, administering the oath of allegiance to Confederate soldiers, and in 1864, you have the Wade Davis bill that is proposed in Congress. This is Republicans in Congress didn't think Reconstruction was harsh enough to the Southern seceding states. These Republicans objected to the 10% plan. They wanted more stringent terms. They wanted those people to in those states to have a 50% voter swearing allegiance population. Lincoln refused to sign the bill. And there's one of those awesome interruptions. Okay, so the Wade Davis bill was the Republicans' answer to the Lincoln-Johnson proposal for reconstruction. And again, they wanted 50% to swear the oath. Lincoln refused to sign the bill, and he pocket vetoed, which means that once the congressional session ends, if the president doesn't sign it, the bill dies. And so it didn't go any further. The Freedmen's Bureau. So what do you do with those African Americans that have now been freed from slavery? In March of 1865, Congress created the new agency called the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands acted as a welfare agency to take care of the needs of these newly freed people. As we mentioned in class, they, they didn't have anything. They didn't have any place to go. They didn't have an education. So the Freedmen's Bureau provided food, shelter, medical supplies, um, and education to these former slaves. They helped blacks resettle in farmlands in the South, um, helping them purchase or rent from former plantation owners. This did cause some conflict in the South as these people were still viewed as less um, worthy than the whites. Oh, look, it gets big. Zoom. Hi, more interruptions. All right, here you go. The Freedmen's Bureau. Oh, it even gets bigger. Look at that. That's nifty. All right, so here is a Freedmen's School, and the children who are attending that Freedmen's School, led by usually white Northerners, went to the South to run these programs. In April of 1865, um, Lincoln was assassinated at the Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth, and this ends Lincoln's re Reconstruction Plan. You have a new president and a new plan. This is Andrew Johnson. So Johnson was a Southerner, but he was loyal to the Union. He's our 17th president. Uh, he issued a plan that was similar to Lincoln's, but included uh, defranchisement, which is a loss disenfranchisement, which is the loss of the right to vote to former Confederate office holders and Confederates with more than $20,000 in taxable property. Basically, he's stripping these secessionists of their right to vote. And he allowed for presidential pardons 
for disloyal Southerners. So he was sort of individually um, pardoning those people. In 1865, the Southern government, what happens to it? Well, they're trying to re-enter the Union. All states qualified for re-entry under Andrew Johnson's Reconstruction Plan. The states created their own constitutions that denounced secession. They had to ratify the 13th Amendment, and no voting rights to blacks appeared in those constitutions. Shocker, right? This upset congressional Republicans and Northern Republicans. You also have the Southern states sort of in their backlash against the federal government, coming up with black codes and then what become Jim Crow laws, which restrict the rights of freed black people. Uh, states in the South prohibited African Americans from renting land or borrowing money to buy land. Um, they created a semi-bondage situation, signed contracts to work for deferred wages, meaning you can rent this land if you work for me and you can live here as long as you work for me. It was a little different from slavery, but not that much. And it prohibited them from testifying against whites in courts. So this period of about 75 years of actual sort of terrorization of African American people in the South really starts at this time. You also have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, um, and they issued warnings to northern carpetbaggers. Carpetbaggers were um, northern abolitionists who went south to help with the reconstruction plan and this was an actual sort of some advertising that appeared in the Tuscaloosa Independent Monitor in September of 1868 sort of threatening these carpetbaggers and they were called carpetbaggers because they actually came into the south with bags that had been made out of carpets rugs uh, so they were essentially threatened Johnson um, you know, the Republicans in the House tried to control Johnson, uh, and he actually vetoes two important bills uh, that were showing his alliance with people in the South. The first was his veto of um, a bill that would have increased the power of the Freedmen's Bureau, and the second was a veto of a civil rights bill that gave blacks citizenship and voting rights. This really upset Republicans in the House, especially people who became known as radical Republicans, who wanted more drastic reform and forced reform in the South. So these radical Republicans, such as Charles Sumner of Massachusetts and Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, who um, were both kind of instrumental in the Emancipation Proclamation push, uh, hoped to reform the South through military rule. They wanted blacks free to have free them to exercise their rights and get an education and so they forced through the civil rights act of 1866 which pronounced that all african americans would be u.s citizens which would repudiate the dred scott decision remember dred scott decision the supreme court ruled that slaves were not citizens that they were property and therefore they could not sue on behalf of themselves or someone else um this attempts to shield these African Americans in the South from these black codes that Southern states are passing. It f there was fear of repeal by the Democrats, and so there were the radical Republicans knew that a law passed by Congress was not going to be as strong as actually changing the Constitution. So they pushed for changing the actual Constitution. So the first amendment they pass is the 14th Amendment, which declared that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens and that they are obligated to um, the equal protection of the laws and due process of the law, regardless of their race, their creed, or their gender. So that is the 14th Amendment, which is one of the three what we call civil rights amendments, which include the 13th, which is the abolition of slavery, the 14th, which is um, known as the Equal Rights Amendment, and then the 15th, which grants African American suffrage. The significance of this 14th Amendment is that states had to follow the Constitution. Up until this part, point, that had always been tested and not really enforced. So it says that states are obligated to respect the rights of any U.S. citizen and give them equal protection of the laws and due process. This becomes a, a key um, stone for the future Civil Rights Act, and we'll, this will become clear later in the course. 
Women and minorities, children and disabled, and those accused of crimes also ultimately get inf included in this 14th Amendment. So in 1867, you have a series of Reconstruction Acts that are passed by Congress, and they are attempting to assert their authority over Johnson and the Confederate members of the House and the Senate. Remember, Johnson is loyal to the South. Radical Republicans want to punish the South. Um, these three acts that Congress passes, uh, despite Johnson's vetoes, place the South under military jurisdiction, so basically under martial law. It increased the requirement for entry into the Union that those states had to actually ratify the 14th Amendment. So they're getting tight. There also you have the first colored senators and representatives who are elected to the House and the Senate. You have um, black judges and postmasters being appointed in the South. And at some point, the Congress gets really fed up with Johnson and his vetoes and how many times he used his veto. So they passed a law called the Tenure of Office Act. And it said that the president could not remove an, a federal official or military commandment commander without Senate approval, which probably was unconstitutional. However, this is to prevent Johnson from removing radical Republicans from his cabinet. He believed that the law was unconstitution, and um, he fired one of Lincoln's appointees, um, I think his name is Edward Stanton, from his cabinet. So he is then impeached in the House of Representatives. Now, impeachment simply means that you're brought up on charges. Remember, we learned that about Andrew Jackson. It does not mean that you're actually removed from office. The charges are brought in the House, and the trial is held in the Senate. He is impeached in the House, um, and the trial is held in the Senate. He was one vote short of removal from office. He was, they were ready to kick him out. In 1868, Ulysses S. Grant wins the White House. He's nominated by the Republicans. And during his term of office, um, the 15th Amendment, the last of the Civil Rights Amendments, gets passed, which grants African Americans the right to vote. Um, under his administration, he also passes the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which guarantees equal protection and accommodations in public places, hotels, restaurants, bars, railroads, etc. Now, this is a promise, but it doesn't get followed through with. And here is a celebratory document of the 15th Amendment. And some more documents. Of All right, so here you can see some advertising from the time period, African Americans voting. Okay, seriously, that's been like five interruptions. Moving on. I'm clicking away from the screen. Okay, Reconstruction in the South. The Republican Party reorganizes and is dominated in the South by ex-Confederate states um, with military protection. Then you have the Scalawags and the Carpetbaggers, which are nicknames for Republicans coming to the, into the South um, to enforce Reconstruction. African-American legislators and government appointees cause bitter resentment in the South. Um, so you have a lot of backlash in the Southern states. You also have sharecropping. You have families in the South reuniting African-American families, learning to read and write, and migrating to cities. You had a big migration at this point into cities like St. Louis and Cincinnati and um, all the way up into Chicago by African Americans. But those who couldn't afford to move settled down and began sharecropping. They created their own um, black Baptist and Methodist churches and, and their black ministers became their community leaders. You had the creation of all black colleges in the late 1800s. Um, and so they're starting to, to rebound culturally. Freedom and the war put the Southern South's economy in turmoil, as we mentioned in class. They still needed large, cheap labor force. So a landlord provided seed and land for a share of the harvest. That's why our share, the term sharecropping comes in. And so uh, many of these former slaves remained dependent on landowners and owed a debt to local mer merchants. They often lived in their former slave cabins. And you can see where sharecropping was really strong. These are still the places that were pretty strong slaveholding regions. 